I'm excited for today. <laughs> Hello, hello, everybody. We are getting rolling without any further ado since Clubhouse is lit. Just a moment. Hmm. Hope everybody's having a good day thus far. It's loading slow, Jason. surrounded by plants as he's like feverishly clicking away trying to figure out how to get this thing going <laughs> all right i see i see the screen club decks coming up fantastic all right ben should be jumping on in just a minute like i said and it is nine o'clock so as soon as london gives me the high sign we will get going sir uh Good to just go. Yeah. All right. We're good to go. Fantastic. That's what I like to hear. Thank you, London. All right. Welcome, 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 welcome to Hota Herbs Grow and Tell. This is our weekly cannabis cultivation club. We are here as we are every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. This show is recorded and simulcast by the Future Cannabis Project on YouTube, FCPO2 channel. So if you are new to the room uh, here on Clubhouse, please click on the little green house up above and join the Future Cannabis Project, as well as give a follow to myself, the other moderators, Jesse, who's brand new to Clubhouse, so everybody can see. Make sure you give him a follow as well. Uh, I'm sure after our conversation tonight, you will want to follow this gentleman more and find out all the great things that he's got going on. I see my good friend Ben has jumped in, and Ben is here. Uh, welcome back, Ben. Uh, ben is here to help moderate tonight. As uh, many of you know, Nick is taking the week off from the grow and tell so i have been given permission to mangle any scientific terms that i want to uh because nick is not here to correct me um i may purposefully uh mispronounce some scientific names tonight just to see if he listens to the replay and i can get an earful next week <laughs> so uh the Grow and Tell is a cultivation club that was originally formed to get local growers together here in Massachusetts, primarily in the Worcester area, to get together on a weekly basis and sniff each other's jars and smoke each other's weed and talk about what they were growing, how they were growing it, you know, what were some of the things they were using? What were some of the inputs? What are some of the breeders whose stuff they were growing? Uh, just kind of learning together. And that is really the, um, the, the, where this was born. It's great having Ben, uh, because Ben actually experienced some of the grow and tell. So he used to come on up to Worcester and, uh, come to the grow and tell. So it's fantastic, even though it was quite a haul and I do appreciate that. So, uh, let's go ahead and introduce the other folks who are up here. Good to see you tonight, Peter. Thank you for joining, sir. I know uh, you and Jesse have spent some space together as well. So I figure I might as well let you go ahead and say hi first, Peter, before you duck off to dinner. <laughs> well, I knew I wasn't going to be late tonight. I knew it was going on. <laughs> That's a step in the right track. Hey, Jesse, how you doing? Doing great, Peter. How about yourself, man? Good. I uh, am getting ready to cook some dinner, so I'm just going to be listening. Fantastic. And uh, thank you and London, as always, for uh, producing 
the grow and tell and making it available on YouTube through the future cannabis project. I do appreciate that. Um, you know, I wanted to also say, uh, while I had both you, Peter and London, uh, that, uh, most of the, most of the comments this weekend, uh, this past weekend at the, uh, regenerative cannabis cultivation conference were about the future cannabis project. It's, uh, it was really interesting. This is like the first time I've gone to an event where um, it wasn't about my Instagram page or my stickers. Uh, most people know my stickers. Uh, they know the, you know, the Hot to Herb sticker. Uh, they've seen it all over the place or they've seen me at a, you know, on Instagram or they've met me at an event behind a breeder table. But this was the first time every, almost everybody who came up to me uh, was like, I was just listening to you, or I was just listening to something on the Future of Cannabis Project. Uh, nothing but fantastic feedback. So I just wanted to give you guys a little appreciation, both Peter and London, for all the great stuff you're doing uh, and all the fantastic content that's on the show. Uh, definitely got some amazing feedback this weekend because of it. All right. Silence. I embarrassed them both. Fantastic. All right. So with me uh, this week to help host and keep me in line. Worst is self-promoters ever. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, so, um, you know, with me this week helping keep me in line is my good friend, Ben Morgan, who actually is the person who introduced me to the Regenerative Cannabis Cultivation Conference series. So, Ben, how are you doing tonight, my friend? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, always a pleasure to be on with you. Always a pleasure to get to you know share the space and uh, continue our journey together. It's been, like you had said, a really beautiful journey that we've had together uh, down this road, getting to get to learn with each other as we you know delved into this world of regenerative agriculture and going to Chris Trump's classes. And I really, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see it coming full circle now as uh, you know we start to be more educators and less students in our own hats in the majority of our life. And it's, it's great to be able to give back. And I'm super, super excited for tonight's conversation because Jesse is, uh, he is just a wealth of knowledge really is. And, uh, he just, every time careful, we get the ben. chance to talk, careful, I get to learn. <laughs> Thanks buddy. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, uh, let's go ahead and introduce Mr. Jesse Porter. Uh, he is, our uh, guest of this evening, uh, Jesse, why don't you go ahead and give a little introduction about yourself? Yeah, I feel a little bit like a guest of honor, man. That's awesome. Um, so I've been in the cannabis industry since 2004. Uh, I started when I um, was going to school at UC Berkeley and my mom got sick with cancer and sort of drove me into the industry. Locally in the Bay Area, I fell into Richard Lee and Jeff Jones and Dale Skye and Oaksterdam and Spent some time there as a professor and ran dispensaries, you know, Blue Sky, SR-71, Bulldog, and got some large-scale cultivation facilities, really started to grow, really wanted to share my knowledge and continue to learn. So opened an 11,000-square-foot hydro shop right behind Harborside and encouraged people to bring in their samples, their leaf tissue, and we would put them in baggies and put them under microscopes and just really sort of like what we're doing here, learn together, share our experiences, talk about positive IDs. And that drove me into the industry to, you know, try to pursue, you know, really good weed. And that's all I ever really wanted to grow um, for my mom who was dying and for myself who really enjoyed it. Um, and then years went by, I saw this commercial activity explode and I saw people really transitioning from sort of legacy to commercial scale and wanted to be a part of that conversation and really had always sort of felt like HVAC was a four letter word. And today, uh, you know, I work for a company, Inspire Transpiration Solutions that manufactures integrated HVAC for cultivation and curing. Uh, and as a result, I've gotten to sort of travel the world a little bit more and see even more facilities at scale and pick up tons of data. And that's something that's uh, been really fun for Ben and I to nerd out. We were nerding out this morning talking about projects and sizing, and transpiration, and all the challenges of these spaces. So, um, yeah, that's sort of my story. And um, I'm always trying to grow and learn and you know, see how I can help other people be successful in space. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, we just met, actually. Uh, ben introduced us. Uh, we just met two weekends ago for the first time. And uh, I, you know, even within the, the short amount of time we got to spend together just chatting, I, I could I could feel 
the aura of knowledge that was uh, that you were containing within that brain of yours. So, um, you know, it, this is, um, you know, it is, a, I feel a little bit off because I don't have Nick here with me tonight, but I will say that this conversation perfectly aligns with the conversation we had last week. So uh, last week, uh, we had a conversation around the phylosphere and the rhizosphere. Uh, and so where we left things off, we, we focused a lot on the phylosphere, um, uh, talking about the exchange of uh, energy and gases and uh, minerals and, and, and some of the differences there. Uh, we talked a little bit more about um, you know, the different things going on in the soil structure as well, and, and some of the similarities between the two. Um, you know, we talk, uh, a lot of people know about the rhizophagic cycle, where you have the uh, bacterial bodies going into the plant through the roots, uh, and then kind of getting reprogrammed and spit back out in a way uh, that they go and, and, and kind of hunt down the thing that the plant wants next. Um, and there's similarly something going on in the phylosphere uh, with uh, cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria being able to uh, go into the stomatos. But there is a lot more going on uh, it, about uh, how plants breathe, uh, how transpiration works in plants uh, than we got into last week. So this is a, a really, really nice, uh, that was a nice segue, I think, into this week's conversation. Well, it's funny you mentioned that too, because I'm always trying to think about all the factors that influence, you know, my sizing and really trying to give people a risk reward proposition. And, and Ben and I have dove into this, right? When you start talking about the 10 cardinal parameters as I see them in the space, you know, microbes is a huge factor and it also impacts water in the root zone and air in the root zone. And when that nutrient cycling occurs, it's hard to predict the level of transpiration because how quick are we cycling in what levels have we built the right fungal colonies to really give out the sugars and exudates that feed these bacteria that break down nutrients and make them available in late stages. Um, there's so many sort of factors that go into that, and that's just below the root zone. We're not talking about velocities to the stomata to break the boundary layer and increase gas change. We're not talking about all these other microclimates and, uh, you know, PPFD factors that influence it, but it's all connected. And I think if you forget about one, you sort of missing the point of all of them and, and really how to optimize the space is thinking about it holistically and balancing all those parameters. Yeah, just the um, decay of organic matter <laughs> releases lots of gases, methane, um, other ethylene. things. Ethylene, ethylene yep. could cause ripening. There's all kinds of factors. And I, I want to maybe even offline explore that with Ben. Like, what if we do have this ethylene production in the right levels at the right PPMs in late stages? Is that going to trigger senescence and give us a more uniform ripening period? Will it shorten the ripening period? Um, I know that's experimented with in tomatoes and some people doing that with canvas now. I, I think it's a little bit out there, but there's there's a road to discovery there for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, I, so many different, again, as you were just starting to touch on, there's so many different aspects of it uh, that impact um, what's going on in the space. And, and when we try to separate these things uh, and not look at them as a holistic system, uh, we make we make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, so uh, I think, you know, maybe uh, one of the things that we should probably start with is a basic discussion of what transpiration is and um, talking a little bit about some of the primary impactive factors on plant transpiration that we normally focus on. Yeah, um, from a plant basic transpiration perspective, I mean, we're trying to pull water through the plant in order to drive immobile nutrients where they need to go. 
and allow that plant to cool itself uh, while sort of simultaneously exchanging gases. So part of the transpiration process is really this energy balance in the space. And I think a, a lot of people are familiar with Plant Empowerment, the book, and sort of the three basic energy balances they bring up, you know, water balance, uh, an assimilate balance, and an energy balance. So for me, thinking about transpiration and, and movement through the plant, this water that we're trying to drive, um, there's all these high-level conversations about BPD. And I love them because it really shows where this industry is going and sort of what we're diving into and what metrics we can use to drive and predict and, um, you know, guide rail plant performance. Um, but I think that, you know, when we really think about the factors that drive transpiration, I know I deal with this a lot, thinking about sizing dehumidification loads for facilities is, you know, what is the light energy coming in? What is the PPSD at the canopy? that's gonna give me a pretty good idea of how much energy that plant is gonna consume and how much water it's gonna to need to balance out that energy. Assuming everything else is operating appropriately, that we have enough CO2 available, what happens to that transpiration as the PPFD goes up is it goes up as well, as long as those other cardinal parameters come with it. So again, it comes back down to that balance, but what we're really trying to do is, in a healthy way, drive water through this plant and in some ways influence the morphology of the plant and the production of secondary metabolites um, and how it you know, expresses in the end. So it's a powerful tool and we've all experienced poor transpiration rates and uh, calcium deficiencies um, and bud rot and powdery mildew uh, due to stagnant water on the leaf tissue that isn't being mobilized appropriately away from the plant. Um, so transpiration is one aspect, but what happens to that transpiration once it gets into the space? Where does it sit on the leaf surface? Does it move away from the leaf surface? What happens to it in the system? And when we get these anaerobic pockets, that's the sort of the crux of poor transpiration is that we start to get water, water molds and mildews that can grow in space. Yeah, I think one of the really best things that you had taught me, Jesse, uh, when thinking about transpiration, when thinking about the metabolism of the plant is by looking at the external limiting factors and then the internal limiting factors. When you first started teaching me about it, you brought up the fact that there's the ability of the plant to photosynthesize, which is influenced by the amount of water that it has, access to photosynthetic radiation, and then it's vapor pressure deficit and its ability to actually transpire and breathe and, and allow that process to cycle. And so you have to look at the external limiting factors of light, water, temperature, humidity, but then you have to look at the internal factors of the plant as how far it's and how well it's balancing those individual aspects based on the things like soil health, nutrient availability, genetic profile, et cetera. Stage and when growth. you said that to me, Absolutely. in stage of growth, when you said that to me, it just sort of like, it really clicked and it stopped being so much a confusing equation and started being a lot more a cycle of life. I think it's it's so easy to get confused when we start really thinking about and talking about VTD. There's a lot of misinformation out there and it can be hard for cultivators to utilize. Sometimes we don't have the mechanical devices needed to really control with enough precision to use VPD as a tool. Other times we're printing out charts and navigating them on a wall when we should be using emissivity adjusted IR guns to truly understand what our leaf temp is. So we know the offset relative to our light and we can change those ambient conditions uh, to create the appropriate leaf condition to drive transpiration how we want, whether it's a low VPD in early stages to prevent stretch or it's a high VPD in late stages to bring upon different senescence. It's, it's a hard tool to crack, but once you really utilize the core concepts um, you can apply them to SOPs immediately and change your set points immediately. But when you're thinking about it uh, as a wall, it becomes, you know, like a, a printout of a VPD chart. It becomes really challenging to navigate because you're saying, hey, what's my condition? What's this? What's that? It's like, go find out what your leaf temp is. Go find out what the humidity is uh, in the space. Get a lot of samples. Get a big sample size and uh, you'll really be able to drive this plant. You'll know why you're driving, why you're changing temperature and humidity. Instead of fear trying to go to 40% RH in late stages, uh, you tackle the problem in a different way. Yeah, I think that that's a really excellent point that you bring up because 
uh, I know at least personally in my original cultivation years that I really looked at crop steering and trying to drive plant growth as a much more nutrient based uh, approach. But you really helped me to understand that really environment is the uh, is the single largest driving factor because without proper environmental influence, the plant doesn't have the capacity to actually transport a lot of these non soluble nutrients like you were talking about. So it's it's. I used to think of VPD as a static thing. Like you said, you print out the chart and you put it on the wall and you reference it. But as I've gone, gotten deeper into it and really learned more about environmental control and really the data analysis and data collection that is so crucial to this, it really began to show me that VPD is a rolling thing. It's, it's fluid and needs to be reacted to and reacted with. But you can only do that with, like you had said, proper data collection, utilizing the tools at hand. Right. It's, it's a tool, uh, not a goal kind of thing. Yeah, I find it fun to even, you can almost feel um, after you've paid attention to your watering cycle and watch your VPD numbers, uh, watch how the environment changes under the different conditions. You can almost tell when the plant needs water because it's uh, affecting the environment around it, at least even in my, you know, in my small grow, uh, in the tent, I can see those humidity levels drop, uh, on a daily average when they need water. You can see that difference, how they're impacting the environment around them <laughs> and, and how they're utilizing the water, uh, is, um, kind of in conjunction with what's happening in that small little ecosphere. Yeah, I mean, I was recently in a facility in Colorado uh, taking a tour and I went through a vegetative grow room. Uh, it was a multi-tier grow room. And I was like, man, these plants are really not looking that good, but the conditions sort of feel okay, right? They had some set points that were, you know, classically Googleable, and uh, okay, right? We're, we're at 85, 60, this is okay. Um, but the reality was when we started taking a look at the leaf temperatures, their VPD was closer to a 0.4. And these plants were struggling to do anything, including root. And all we did was change some set points, ambient set points in the space, didn't even change airflow. And within hours, you know, the second tour that I was on through that facility, those plants looked a lot better. And uh, come to learn, you know, probably, you know, let's call it eight weeks later, um, after they'd finished the cycle, they told me they were able to trim their veg time down by 14 days. It went from, you know, 24 days to, to 10 days. And uh, to me, I think that's a testament of just plant health and, you know, how understanding how that ambient condition impacts the true plant. You know, we talk a lot about what's the right condition. It's like, let's look at the plant level and really understand what's going on there. Like you're talking about, um, you know, reading the plant in the tent, you can see them respond. You, you know exactly how they're, how they're doing. They're praying to you, they're talking to you, or they're, they're drooping with the sad face. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we've gotten a bit into, <clears throat> you know, some of the mechanics uh, in the past and some of the other episodes that we've done in the past. I know we talked a, a bit about how water moves through the plant uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to me uh, that it's this, um, there, there's, there's pressure. It's almost like a, a vacuum is created uh, you know, the moisture comes out the leaves, out the stomata, and, and you can, it kind of pulls in more water up the, up the, up the stems and, and up the branches and, and up the trunk and, and in through the roots. It's like, you know, that suction, it's waiting uh, for that vacuum pressure almost to pull in those uh, molecules of water from the roots um, and the plant, you know, it knows when it needs more and it just kind of sucks those things in and then has that ability to, to bring that water, uh, you know, many, many feet. I mean, you know, a 70 or 80 foot tree is able to pull that water all the way up and as it's pulling it up further and further i'm sure there's some increased pressure from gravity alone uh, so it's really really impressive what plants can do with water just in, in moving it through their bodies and think about it she's so thirsty she's 
soaking up this water like a water balloon. And if you have inappropriate vapor pressure deficit, there's nowhere for that water to go. And she gets trapped like this stagnant water balloon where she just wants to leak out a little bit of water to cool herself. And that's, to me, sort of the BPD tool is how hard are you sucking? When do you want to suck on that straw really hard? When do you want it to be a boba straw? When do you want to pull lots through? Or when do you want it to be sort of a thin martini straw kind of thing? Yeah, we want that boba straw because we don't want to... Uh... We want to be careful with our microbiology, right? <laughs> we don't want to send it through that really, really fine mesh and crush all those beautiful fungal hyphae that we created before we fed. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a big believer in the big boba straw approach. <laughs> Great. Okay, so... Um, we are uh we're a bit in here and i think we've talked a little bit about um you know what is going on uh with transpiration and, and a little bit about some of the environmental impacts um that we can see uh we've definitely uh, mentioned that things need to be uh looked at in systems so you've mentioned you know we've mentioned water uptake we've mentioned uh vpd uh, keeping an eye on VPD. What are some of the other things that should be taken into account uh, when you're looking at transpiration and, and how the, the room is, is working and your space is working? That's a great question. You know, I've seen a lot of data and I ask this question, you know, every single day to try and pick it every tidbit I can. And one thing that I've really noticed is when we're talking about driving transpiration, we're talking about driving moisture into the space. And I've seen people um, and haven't really been able to dive into the data well enough, but as high as 1700 at, at the canopy level, PPFD of light intensity, having to water at a 0.44 per canopy square foot rate. And that might not mean anything to you, but that is really high and almost twice as much as what you would use for like a 630 watt fixture that's providing a thousand PPFD. And Ben and I talk about this a lot as people chase this higher PPFD environment, they're driving transpiration and need to make sure that sure we're accounting for the sensible, the cooling that we need in the space, but also for that latent load, the moisture removal. Um, and as those PPFDs drive up, we're able to increase the airflow velocities in the space. So whether it's a small space or a big space with more light intensity, we're able to whip air past the plant quicker without losing stomatal conductance, without this plant shutting down. Um, what I normally see at 1,000 PPFD is we want you know, a, a velocity of around 0.5 to 0.7 meters per second com coming bottom up to break that boundary layer and increase stomatal activity and gas exchange that can be is even up to triple in a high PPFD environment, whereas in a low PPFD environment, that would shut the plant down. Um, so airflow is a big factor as well. How quickly are we able to move that moisture away from the plant, treat the appropriate vapor pressures def deficits acutely, um, and allow that plant to really breathe and transpire? So for me, PPFD is a big one, and airflow is another big one that really dramatically affect uh, how, how the tran plant transpires. Yeah, those are uh, pretty extreme numbers. I know that um, when I've gotten up around 12 to 1400 PPFD, the plant is just drooping, can't take it. Uh, it's way too much light and uh, I need to drop the intensity. The plants tend to do better uh, from what I've seen in my, uh, in my five by five space. Uh, around that 900 to 1,000 range uh, usually is, is closer to where I'm at, maybe into the 1,100 range, but usually not much more than that. And I think if you could intravenously inject CO2 into your plant at 1,500 pp, ppm and drive those velocities past you and keep the fertigation oh, so automated that it's balanced with all this, you might be able to see a healthier plant in that high PPFD environment, but it's so hard to keep up with those other parameters um, that usually that's what we see is, okay, 
I don't have the capacity to control the VPD, but what I can do is dim my lights, reduce my fertigation input, which is going to reduce moisture into the space. And now these plants are in a much healthier environment for them to continue their life cycle. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things on it is that you have to think of it as a balancing act. It's an equation but it's a compounding equation and what i mean by that is every single one of the factors in the equation light intensity irrigation amount and volume and, and frequency uh air speed movement temperature in the room leaf temperature humidity in the room co2 all of these elements within this equation are affected by the other elements within the equation so if you adjust light intensity, you have to adjust every other single parameter within that equation because they're all reflective of each other to come together homogeneously and create this perfect environment within the plant and outside the plant to optimize its growth potential. When Jesse was talking about that, he and I, you know, spitball numbers, you know, when I'm designing facilities, Jesse's always one of the first people that I go to, to run ideas by, act as a sounding board and be a, you know, a general, you know, good, uh, good voice in the room when I'm trying to think things out. And one of the things that you have to think about is what is your end product? What's your goal that you're looking to achieve with your cultivation? Because that really is the driving force beyond anything else that needs to determine what style of cultivation you do. So if you're growing for personal consumption of high terpene, high cannabinoid, low uh, yield, that's one thing. If you're growing for extremely high yields and as high as you can get on cannabinoid and terpene profiles while maximizing yield, that's a whole other type of grow. If you're growing for extracts, that's a whole other type of grow. So you really need to start with where you want to finish and work your way backwards to find these parameter set points that you can dial it in. And then understanding the plant's metabolism and understanding how those different factors play together. So that way you can create the optimal you know, environment for your plant, whether you're running atmospheric CO2 at 400 to 500 PPMs, or if you're juicing it at 1200 to 1600 PPMs. You need to be able to balance the light intensity to that because, again, it all comes down to the plant's metabolism and its ability to, you know, take those three major inputs and utilize them for the purpose of cellular growth. And I don't think anyone here would discredit the role of genetics, right? You know, when we talk about VPD, we're still at a high level talking generally about cannabis. And I think when we think about environmental itineraries and temperature and humidity set points and how we want to quote unquote crop steer the plant, whether it's day to night differential temperatures and whatnot, a lot of that um, isn't fully vetted out. And the way I think about it is being a breeder for a long time, I have a property in Northern California on the California Oregon border. So I do a lot of outdoor there. Um, ben knows I do a lot of regenerative and I love that approach. Um, but what I've really learned over time is that, you know, if we're gonna pick a VPD, we're picking a generic VPD for cannabis. If we really wanna fine tune, it's about fine tuning per cultivar as well. So if we're running papaya for extract, we might run significantly different conditions like Ben mentioned, because we have different goals. Or if we have a strain from you know, the Hindu Kush mountain range, and sure it's a polyhybrid, but it's dominant, um, then we can give it more arid conditions and cooler conditions versus a Colombian hybrid that has that in its genetic backbone and might lean that way is going to want to see warmer and more humid conditions late and be very capable of tolerating those conditions. Um, so I think sometimes it's important to think about the cultivar and, and how it grows and, and how you want to see her perform in that space because you get a lot of power in either limiting her or letting her express her phenotypic uh, powers. Yeah, I think that people really sort of need to step back off and take the, the human hubris factor out of the equation. A lot like we talk about with regenerative farming, you know, we don't really grow the plants. We tend to the microbes and the microbes really feed our plant structure. It's the same sort of thing here. We need to sort of stop thinking about, I think, just what we want the plants to do. Genetically, we need to consider what the plant wants to do. What is it originally geared and genetically engineered towards over, you know, millennia of natural growth and cultivation, even when we get to the point where we have these polyhybrids that have been removed from their natural environments, for, you know some of them decades and decades, you know, epigenetics still plays a role in that. And there's still, you know, hereditary traits that no matter how much hybridization we've seen, they still play true and they still have an influencing factor. All right. We are just past the 930 mark. So we can go ahead and give a quick reset to the room. Welcome everybody to Hota Herbs Grow and Tell. This is episode 28. We are here tonight talking about transpiration. 
with our guest tonight, Jesse Porter, and special uh, an, uh, assistant uh, helping us out tonight, Ben, uh, helping me moderate the room. I appreciate everybody joining. We are recorded and simulcast, as always, on the Future Cannabis Project, FCPO2 channel. Uh, if you are just listening for the first time, make sure you click on the little greenhouse at the top here in Clubhouse and subscribe to the YouTube channel on YouTube, on uh, FCPO2 on YouTube. Uh, in fact, subscribe to both of them, both the Future Cannabis Project and FCPO2. Uh, if you have time, uh, you may also want to check out uh, some of the great stuff going on at the Daga Academy, uh, which is the Future Cannabis Project site. There's seeds out there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other information and links out there as well. So uh, definitely check out all the great stuff that's going on in the Future Cannabis Project on both YouTube channels as well as what's happening on the website too. I know London's got some really super cool uh, puzzle box type seed things going on over there, which definitely want to check out. Uh, and, and then you can keep those boxes <clears throat> and torture your friends and children with them. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. we got a really nice, uh, crowd on uh, YouTube tonight. I appreciate uh, everybody joining us. We've got Abraham and Nate, Miranda Farms, Detroit River Rat, uh, Bud E. Kilowatt, Laura Camp, EJ Faya, Jared Hansen, Big Jar. Everybody, welcome. Appreciate you joining us. We've got Brian and Adele and Michelle and Steve and Lamar, Drew, Mikel. Casey, Robin, Amos, Corey, what's going on? Eric, Tyson, Big, Abe, Taylor, Caleb, D. Locke, Ape, Richard, Madison, and Stoney. Thank you all for joining us. Brian, I will bring you up in a little while once we get through our main conversation. I appreciate you raising your hand and wanting to jump into the conversation. So let's get back into it, gentlemen. Uh, what are some other... Uh, areas of consideration we've talked kind of about a little bit about the medium but maybe it's a good idea to spend a little bit more time having a little a quick discussion about why the medium uh, that you're growing in is important yeah i think you know ben's probably going to want to dive into this, but when we talk about controlling transpiration, which is a, a big challenge in the space, let's be honest, um, it really does have a lot to do with the water holding capability and the activity in that root zone. That rhizosphere is going to drive so much. And whether it's a, you know, heavy dry back scenario with rock wool or a hybrid cocoa approach, or, you know, Ben and I have really tried to understand what we need to think about from a perspective of living soil in these spaces. How much extra moisture is going into the space that we need to consider that affects the transpiration of the plant and the BPD. Um, and each one of these media choices has a pretty dramatic effect on the nutrient cycling, how water gets into the air, the air to water porosity, and also how they're impacted by the ambient conditions that we do set to drive VPD. As we get into these deeper conversations about, hey, let's make sure our leaf temp 78 to 82 degrees to drive photosynthetic activity, what's that doing to the root zone? Is that too warm? Is that appropriately warm? Are we paying attention to that? And what happens in the lights on cycle that helps for respiration so we can prep for transpiration again the next day? Um, the media and how it deals with that temperature swing is really important too. I'm sure you got a bunch to add, Ben. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, living soil being my primary wheelhouse, one of the major issues that we try to deal with and that Jesse and I constantly are tackling is the respiration of soil. And it's, you know, everybody thinks about the respiration of the plants and how they transpire and they're putting moisture into the air and they're off gassing uh, oxygen and consuming CO2. But a less thought about aspect of it is what happens in the soil structure. So when you have living soil, it respirates at night when your plants are not respirating as much. So you can actually have massive, massive CO2 spikes at night with large scale, CO, uh, with large scale living soil cultivations. And when I say massive, I, I mean the, uh, the average CO2 consumption, so like atmospheric is 400 to 500, sometimes 600, depending where you are. Um, but really it's about that 400 mark. And when we start to juice with CO2, 
you know, we usually talk about PPM levels of 1200 to a maximum of 15, 1600. But I've seen facilities that I've walked into that were having massive issues with trying to manage CO2 control at night. And their alarms were actually going off. There's, there's CO2 systems that have what's called life alert alarms, which basically means if CO2 parameters, PPMs go above a certain measurement, it starts to uh, initiate a procedure which purges the entire room of CO2 because it's toxic to humans at that level. It can actually kill you. So what we found was that there's these extremely heavily microbially active living soils were respirating to such an extent at night that not only was our humidity peaking higher than it was during lights on, where a lot of that moisture was being uptaked by the plant during its consumption we were also seeing massive CO2 dumps. And when I say massive, I'm referring to levels of, you know, 5,000 PPMs. It was, it was really astonishing and staggering. We actually had to, to look at every single one of the parameters in the room and make sure that we didn't have a secondary CO2 leak or a regulator that was somehow malfunctioning. And uh, it was very interesting to see that in the end, it actually was coming from the soil. So that's one of the considerations that you have to take in. But another thing is like, not everybody grows in living soils. A lot of people grow in you know let's say rock wool cubes or uh cocoa chore or even you know like a deep water roots or a hydroponic system or even like an nft uh so what we see here is that each of these has a different rate of transfer a uh, different rate of moisture absorption that it puts into the air all on its own so the more closed loop to your system is the easier it is for you to manage but it still has these parameters that need to be considered so when you're looking at it, you really need to consider how much moisture is going in. You'll often hear Jesse talk about, you know, rates of moisture removal. And we do that rate of moisture removal based off of the amount of water that we know is going into that room per square foot, the amount of plants in that room, the vapor pressure deficit, along with the PPFD on canopy, we're able to, or rather he is able to algorithmically equate what the uh, transpiration levels will equate to and what that you know latent load will be as far as the actual amount of water coming out of the air in a uh, minute by or hour by hour to some extent minute by minute with the transpire system with the uh, inspire, inspire systems they've got such amazing data collection that you can literally watch your plants grow and breathe in live action for me that was one of the the biggest points of turning in my understanding of plant growth was when i actually started to have all of these different data points that i could look at and understand what their interactions were on a live scale and watch the system happen, watch things react and watch how my inputs to a plant and to a plant's environment directly influenced its growth potential. Oh, ben, you're speaking so much to my journey, man. I think that that was the key for me transitioning to what I thought was a master grower to really understanding what long-term success was in the space. It was taking all that tribal knowledge that I'd cultivated for 18 years, seven days a week, hands in the dirt, really learning by doing and saying, okay, I know what's going on in this room. I can read it, but what does the data say? And what else can that tell me? Being able to correlate what I see and feel in the room to the data collection allowed me to be so much more dangerous in adapting my SOPs and changing my approach because I could see the data. And like you say, we follow it all the way through COAs, through yield number, through price, price per pound, because I don't care what you're doing from an efficiency perspective unless we're growing fire. Um, but to me, that's, that's the core of, of the journey for job security for people that have cultivated this wonderful and incredibly useful knowledge is that there's a gap. There's all this data collection and not enough anal analysis of that data with with real world background to say, this is what's happening. This is what we should do next. This is what I want to change. So there's a lot of data out there and it takes the community as a whole to sort through it and validate and verify. And it's been so fun on my journey to do that because I've always been the guy that questioned everything. You know, I never let anyone talk about tomatoes or strawberries in my shop unless they were growing tomatoes or strawberries. Let's talk about the real thing and the real data. <laughs> so when someone cites another plant, I'm like, can we talk about cannabis again, please? Absolutely. That was, uh, I, uh, so, so much of what you just said is, is, is near and dear to me. Number one, uh, I did have to, for many years, go into shops and say tomatoes. Uh, and I was very, very appreciative. <laughs> I was very, very appreciative when I could actually go into a shop and actually talk about cannabis. Uh, to be able to walk into a shop and say, yes, I am growing cannabis. 
what do you recommend as opposed to, hey man, I'm growing some tomatoes. Can you help me with my tomatoes? Yeah, and no, you absolutely. have to say it like that too, right? And it's yes, it's absolutely. So silly as a absolutely who's been fighting. It's like, come on, man, I'm fight. I can't even say this in this shop. That seems yes, wrong. yes. Um, and, and so um, the other piece of what you said, which I love, is is data, uh, because that is what I do uh, as a professional is correlate data together uh, for very large corporations, primarily for normally for marketing and sales and, and other types of, uh, other types of things. And, and so, uh, we're actually going to get into a conversation around data, uh, either next week or the week after, uh, we have Ben, uh, a, a great gentleman who I also met this past weekend, uh, who is going to be, who is doing a, a bunch of cool, uh, has done a bunch of cool analysis with data from the grow off. Uh, so for those that are unfamiliar with the grow off, the grow off is a uh, competition that's usually done state by state. And they've done it all over the country at this point. Ben is involved in the grow off now. Um, and uh, what they do is they give uh, the same clone uh, as uniform of a clone as possible to a whole bunch of growers and then at the end, they judge the end results based on numbers. So terpene counts and cannabinoid counts. It's not about, you know, people's opinions and, and whether you like fruit stuff or not. It's just based on numbers. Well, all that data uh, has been, they've been collecting all that data. And Ben did a whole bunch of uh, analysis and data science on it and found some really cool Jeez. correlations uh, between certain terpenes and some other stuff. So we're going to have a conversation around data, data maturity, how to, how to talk about building a data maturity model, because that's my specialty. And we're going to get into some of the really, really cool things he uh, found. And London uh, you know, I'm going to give you a heads up now. We're going to we're going to need you to assist us because we've got some charts and some graphs that we're going to be showing for that uh, mm -hmm. for that thing as well. So uh, that's going to be a really, really good one. And, and it's I'm not sure if it's going to be next week or the week after. I still got to get with him. Uh, but that is coming. We're going to talk about data and and how people can build their own little data maturity model to understand the data they have and some ways to start correlating that information. Because uh, as you said, Jesse, it's one thing to have the data. It's another thing to be able to take those data points and put them together in a way that helps you make smart decisions. As we're talking about data, I'm literally sitting in uh, my five by five R&D tent or one of them. And I'm doing data collection as we speak. I'm doing IR leaf temperature measurements. I just did a uh, quantum meter reading. So that's a basically like a, uh, a light meter specifically designed for numerous types of light application. It can do LED, CFL, HID, or sunlight. So it's the quantum meter from Apogee. And uh, I was just, you know, checking my PPFDs on Canopy while we were talking about it and checking my IR to make sure that my leaf transpiration should be as good as it can be to despite what the uh, current environment is, because I'm growing in a suboptimal environment right now. But being aware of those data points allows you to sort of curtail which of those suboptimal um, parameters are the most important for you to, to really pay attention to and to try to monitor. Yeah, I think it's, it's funny, you know, we think of data being like big data and it's only accessible to a bazillion data points, but I've seen so many presentations in the infancy of this industry as thought leaders emerged and people were experts. Uh, there were times where people would say, I have, you know, five growers I talk to, and now I'm going to get up and give a 45 minute presentation. And I always thought to myself, is that really good information to share with everyone? And, uh, you know, I think the more small scale growers, the more backyard growers, the more every grower starts to just think about the data for real and, you know, whatever they can collect and try and use, uh, the more we can tie it all together. I mean, this industry was built in backyards and on small farms and in garages. And uh, I don't think we should discredit that data by any means. We should just adjust for accuracy. 
um, like you said, sort of build a data model that we can use for ourselves and achieve our own KPIs and goals. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, bro. Hold on, just real quick. Just I, I want to say thank you, Brian, 4.20 p.m. Actionable, actionable data used to be the buzzword. Now it's data maturity, all good. Uh, actually, they're two separate things because you cannot have actionable data without some data maturity to understand the data that you have. Um, data maturity and actionable data are two different things. But again, I've been geeking out on that shit for 25 plus years. So um, the buzzwords are heavy and uh, the technology buzz stuff has been implanted in my brain at a very deep level at this point after that long. <laughs> I, was, I was involved in Y2K for God's sakes. That's how long I've been in, uh, around computers. I had to stay up at the phone company uh, till after midnight to make sure that the phone systems in the United States didn't shut down uh, when the clocks flipped to 2000. <laughs> Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so, uh, uh, so we've talked. Uh, you know, I, I personally have seen that. Uh, what we were talking about earlier uh, that you mentioned, Ben, the differences in the amount of soil. Um, you know, I see. I've seen the differences in in humidity just by adding another eight gallon pot to the to the tent. You'll you'll see a change in in the overall. Uh, average humidity in the tent. If you have three plants in there and you add a fourth in, uh, you definitely, definitely, and this was something we used to warn people about when I worked for Honor, is when you switch to a bed, <laughs> you know, you put a four by four bed in a four by four tent, you've got a lot of moisture to deal with. And uh, I always tried to recommend that people uh, you know, leave a little bit of airspace in there, not necessarily try to cram the largest bed they can fit into the tent. So if you have a, a four by four tent, you should have a three by three bed. If you're going to do a four by four bed, you should have at least a five by five tent. Uh, so you have some ability to move air around uh, the bed itself. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. Like we get so excited about, you know, once we get that skill set, you really want to optimize the tent and that small space so you cram as much canopy in there as you can. And you're thinking, this is going great for the first four weeks. And then you realize you have this huge moisture load that you're really not able to deal with. And as you get this humidity buildup underneath the canopy where all those stomata are, it sort of sits there. And then the heat comes down from the lights and you have this sort of trampoline effect where the heat just bounces off and doesn't get down below. And you have this microclimate with a lot of moisture. Um, because we put so much canopy in there. And if we could have just left a little bit of wiggle room for that um, you know, cold, humid air to escape and potentially blow that up towards the light and evacuate it out of the space, uh, we'd be doing a lot better to remove the pressure on the plant from a humidity perspective um, and get more homogenized leaf temperatures. Yeah, and this is an equally you know, present issue when we're talking about you know, a 10,000 square foot facility or a 10 by 10 room that somebody's growing in at their house. It's, it's about understanding your space and understanding about how the parameters that you're putting into there are gonna cause it to react. I see that so often with multi-tier. Um, people get really excited about room utilization and I think it's great. And you know, fixed cost absorption and all the benefits of going multi-tier, um, but they don't always consider supply return and air configuration and what does the airflow look like in the racks and not just the room. Um, so you can put all this canopy in there, but not effectively move air through the, the leaves or get that conditioned CO2 rich air to the plants and be, you know, creating a wall of sweaty, uh, non-breathing cannabis that is going to grow mold and spread it throughout the facility as soon as it gets into the airstream. Um, so you're right, Ben. I mean, it's a big consideration. I see people cram too much in sometimes and just, you know, inappropriate airflow supply other times. Um, because you really can get a lot of canopy in there, especially with rolling racks. But if you're not considering those factors of making sure that you can migrate heat and moisture away from the plants effectively, uh, you're doomed for failure. Yeah, I think that's actually also a perfect spot for me to shamelessly plug you. Um, the in-air vertical racking systems that a number of companies are starting to come out with, but that really, you know, transpire inspiration, or sorry, inspire transpiration really helped to spearhead has 
really, really changed a lot of the perspective around what microclimates are within canopy. And I mean, we think about growing these lush, dense beds, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, living soil beds or just, you know, mobile rolling racks of multi-tier or single tier hydroponic styles or soil styles. And we don't often think about the actual microclimates that are created within the canopy itself, especially when we start to go from flower, uh, the beginning stages of flower into a more developed, mature stage of flower, we start to get such a dense, well, hopefully you do, start to get such a dense grouping of colas together that it can really be very averse to allowing air to penetrate into it. And so by doing this, you know, vertical racking, uh, vertical air racking style, where you're actually throwing your air and throwing CO2 directly up underneath the canopy through the canopy from a lower angle that actually pushes it directly past the stomata. It's, you know, it's like if you're trying to get a breath of fresh air, do you want air blowing straight in your face or do you want blow air blowing from behind your head and you're trying to catch it and pull it into your mouth as it's going by you? And that's really the difference between blowing down air down over a canopy or across a canopy or blowing air up underneath the canopy. The stomata of the plant where it's able to take this gas exchange point is at the lower section of the leaf. So we really want to be targeted with where we're applying CO2 rather than just allowing it to disperse through the atmosphere and slowly, gradually settle down because it's heavier than air is. If we actually start from a lower perspective and pump it upwards, we get a much, much better effect. And we also get honestly better plant health because you're now actually allowing, provided that all the other parameters are cycling properly, like we had discussed earlier, you're allowing for that almost mainlining of CO2, like Jesse was jokingly talking about earlier. But that's really the closest way you can get to it is by directly supplying CO2 and fresh air to the lower sections of the plant canopy and penetrating up through the canopy, hitting all those stomata and breaking up those microclimates as well, which really helps with pathogen incursion. Thanks for the plug, Ben. I think the best part of me being at Inspire now and not having to spend seven days a week in my grow anymore is that I get to spend money on things that are different than fertigation skids and lighting and racking and uh, you know insulated panels. And instead, I get to spend the money on computational fluid dynamic modeling and you know ten thousand dollar moisture and water activity meters. Uh, the expenditures for cannabis growth on this side are a little different and um, they've allowed me to really collect a lot of data and question the data having run a lot of models um, you know I've been growing for a while I could design a facility and running those through and seeing where the problems in my basic design were from an airflow perspective and then applying that to real facilities and saying oh we're not capturing that we still need to better understand the gas exchange and the thermodynamics of this convective cooling that's occurring and once we've really got those parameters in place it really did teach us that Oh man, the best way to do this is by taking that, you know, CO2 conditioned rich air and applying it bottom up. And you can do that at any scale. You know, you can get a fan and bring in, in air low to the tent and try and blow it underneath the canopy and it'll capture that cooler air, that CO2 that's naturally occurring, push it with the appropriate velocities to break the boundary layer and increase CO2 assimilation while simultaneously eliminating microclimates, homogenizing the leaf condition, and allowing for better air cycling in the space. To me, it was one of those aha moments of, oh, this is, this is how you do it. And you might need additional fans in the space, but that is the critical place where you can influence transpiration, still model conductance, gas exchange, so many other factors of plant growth. Um, you know, again, big aha moment with the data of like, oh, that's, that's backing it up. And then we've done trials and you know, seen significant increase of CO2 assimilation and CO2 assimilation efficiency, and that we could actually apply lower levels of CO2 and still get the same rate of assimilation because of the availability versus having to run at 1500, we could run at 1100 and get a thousand assimilation versus 1500 to get a thousand. Um, I'm blabbering now, but I think you guys hear where I'm coming from. I get excited about this stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not at all. You're here to blabber. That's why we invited you. We want you to blabber. Cool, man. Um, <laughs> I smoked right before I came. I thought that would be the most appropriate mind to be in. That's why it's transpiration <laughs> with Jesse Porter. It isn't just about, uh, it, we didn't put non-babbling, in a, and uh, but I do appreciate that. Uh, so um, we are at 
the one hour mark. So I wanted to quickly go ahead and uh, reset the room. Uh, we are here at Hota Herbs Grow and Tell. This is our weekly cannabis cultivation club. I do appreciate everybody for joining us here every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. As always, we are recorded and simulcast on the Future Cannabis Project, FCPO2 channel. My good friends, London and Peter, help every week produce my show as well as a ton of other content. You could pretty much watch that channel almost all day long at this point with all the content that is out there. Um, it's really hard to keep up and uh, it's it's quite quite uh, quite amazing to be part of this whole uh, Future Cannabis Project thing. So I do appreciate them and I uh, do appreciate you all for listening to myself as well as the other Future Cannabis Project shows. So thank you all for joining us uh, this week. Uh, we are talking about transpiration with uh, my good friend Ben and our special guest, Jesse Porter. Uh, so um, what a, we've talked a good amount about airflow and um, some of the different you know, coming at it from a different direction was really what we were talking about most recently. And I, 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 you know, I think that kind of breaks away from a lot of the conventional wisdom where most of the time CO2 has been dropped from the top, uh, as Ben mentioned, to allow it to fall because it's heavier. Um, I remember back in the day, uh, reading, uh, you know, about kind of gorilla mechanisms for creating CO2 by create, you know, taking baking soda and vinegar and mixing them together and putting them in ice trays and then putting them up at the, you know, on top of the closet, at the top of the closet or over your lights somewhere so that that CO2 would fall gently onto the plants. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about actually just kind of pushing it and uh, pumping it directly up into the stomata. So that's very interesting. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm totally with you. CO2 is heavy. And for years, I ran all kinds of modified spider lines and then got into copper and got into solenoids and got a lot better with CO2 dispersal from up high. But the more you think about it, where does the gas exchange occur uh, with that CO2 assimilation? It occurs at the stomata. And where are the stomata at? The undersides of the leaves. And what we really discovered was that it's really hard to maintain the appropriate velocities at the underside of the leaf to get that CO2 assimilation like you'd get outside with a nice breeze. If you're just dribbling down CO2, it hits the top of the plant like an umbrella and rolls off like rain. And if we don't have enough bottom up um, CO2, we're essentially waiting for the CO2 PPMs at the lowest level of that space to increase enough to just pressurize those stomata with so much CO2 intensity. Whereas if we can provide velocity and CO2, uh, we can get that assimilation of the CO2 rather than just draping it over an umbrella and hoping that the plant underneath absorbs lots of that water. That's sort of one way I like to think about it and visualize it. Yeah, and just to, to sort of like, we were talking about like large scale facilities and how we do this at a you know, an optimal level using in racking uh, airflow. But Jesse had alluded to the fact that, you know, you can do this at home. This doesn't have to be something that's super high tech. You can get a small inline fan and a little bit of duct work that you can, you know, cut some holes into at the directions and, and distances that you want. And then just run that through the lower portion of your, you know, either the floor of your tent, if you're running in beds, I mean, in uh, pots and sort of weave it between the pots and get it to the point where, you know, you position it so that it blows up at that angle um, so that it hits the lower stomata of the plant or if you're running a bed you can you know just sort of run it right down the middle of the bed uh just above soil i would make sure that you have something that's there that can actually act as a barrier between your soil and your conduit but you know it's it doesn't have to be super high tech it doesn't have to be uh you know some crazy expensive system for the home grower to be able to benefit from some of this utilization i agree i think that on the highest level, when you're investing in a commercial facility, you want to make sure that the CFMs are going to maintain the velocities throughout the length of that tube all the way. Um, there might be some drop off, but you really need to be able to maintain those velocities. In a smaller home growth setup, just get that air flowing bottom up because it does so many other things other than CO2 assimilation. But I'm a huge fan of okay, well, I've got my grow tent over here and I'm going to suck CO2 from my mushroom tent over here. 
And that's where I'm going to be pulling that, that air from. So to me, I, I sort of love that idea of let's go dual purpose and let's just grab some air from something else we're doing that might be super useful and CO2 rich and cycle that air bottom up. And um, it does allow you to sort of get that humidity out of the space in a non-settling way. If you can get that air flowing like a river bottom up, that's the undercurrent, the leaves are moving, that's the ripple effect. And then all the air is headed towards the waterfall, which is the evacuation point for the humidity. So, you know, this is something that um, I've talked a lot about in the past, and, and I know there's a lot of uh, discussion around it, you know, how CO2, is it really useful for tent growers? Okay. Um, you know, my conjecture, conjecture is that number one, and, and I've, I've monitored my CO2, so I, I've been watching my levels and they usually don't go below about 450. Uh, but, and most of the time they're usually in the six to 700 range on average. I'm in a really, really big basement <clears throat> and I have a five by five tent and I'm running a six inch fan that's pulling air in and I have a six inch fair fan that's pulling air out. Uh, so I've get, you know, there's no negative or positive pressure. It's completely even. Um, but the air itself is basically cycling, uh, within about a minute and a half. I'm pulling all of the air out of that tent and pulling a fresh set of air in. So if I turn on a CO2 tank in that tent, more likely than not, I'm probably just going to be pumping it back out into my basement as opposed to necessarily getting it to my plants unless I intervene and shut my fans off during that time period. I love this. Um, as a tent grower, I would definitely say that you know, paying for CO2 might be a nice to have, not a need to have, considering the ambient conditions and how much waste is going on. If you have CO2 to waste, yeah, why not pump it into the grow? The other thing I like to think about in a five by five tent is, as you know, you have good controls, you're collecting data. There's still situations where you might have a temperature or a humidity swing or something that you're dealing with from a stress scenario. And one thing I like to say is that when you add CO2, you're sort of adding jet fuel or you're adding race car fuel to the car. So make sure it's the right car and you're ready to drive it. Otherwise, you could wreck it pretty quickly. You could offset the assimilate water and energy balance in the space causing lockout. Um, you could stress the plant. You could immediately create calcium deficiencies, which are mobile nutrients, which won't be carried appropriately because the plant's consuming so much CO2, she's trying to build too quickly to a point where she can't keep up. So again, we keep alluding to this balance. I think it is a balance. And the faster you want to pump CO2 into the room, be ready to make sure you can effectively dehumidify it. And air cycling every minute is fantastic. Uh, but an air cycling in a non, um, you know, full capture system, there's definitely some waste going on there. Yeah, I think it, you know, it really comes back to what are your, what's your goals? If, if you're looking to really maximize your space and you are already running, you know, a high VPD and high PPFDs on canopy, then it may be beneficial to you to bring a little bit of CO2 in there, feed it directly through to this bottom of the stomata. And then yes, you will have some loss, but if you're able to monitor and dial in your usage enough, I think that you'd be able to get to the point where your loss would be comparable to the amount of assimilation that you'd be gaining into the stomata. But again, it, it's like Jesse said, unless all of the other aspects of that equation are ready for that boost, for that rocket fuel, um, CO2 can be very detrimental. Just like if you had everything else dialed pretty nicely for a lower end cultivation, and then you suddenly juiced your VPD way too high, or you suddenly juiced your PPFD on canopy way too high. If any one of those parameters are outside of the sort of happy zone for where the other parameters are, you can run into very, very rapid, very significant issues. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, for me, I have the tank. It's pretty much been full for quite a while, just sitting there ready to be used. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I, I don't think... 
Um, I, I have not set up my, actually, I have not set up my uh, dispersal system since I moved. Uh, so I moved in August and um, I did have the CO2 system set up on my tent previously. But uh, since I moved, I actually have not reset up the tank. Uh, that's one of the last things or items I had not done. And um, again, some of it was because I was waiting to have a good CO2 monitor. I wanted to see what my CO2 numbers were in the space understand you know how much the plants are using uh how much i might benefit from it um and again it's it's one of those things where i would have to it has to be a coordinated activity in my mind unless i want to be wasteful right um yeah. if i'm going to if I'm going to kind of give them a boost maybe turn the fan off for the the exhaust fan and the intake fan off for a half an hour or 15 minutes and, and pump in some CO2 um, and let the plants absorb it and then turn everything back on and, and give them, you know, maybe a couple boosts a day type of a deal. Yeah. I think you really bring up something interesting. You're talking about, you know, understanding how to best utilize it and when to utilize it as a tool. And we talked about data and data maturity and analysis of the data I don't think we got too much into accuracy of the data. And to me, one of the hot buttons is CO2 sensors and monitoring. And for a guy who's used that for years to try and justify the expense of CO2 as I was scaling uh, to better understand if it was worth it, it was really hard to get accurate CO2 information. Uh, and as I've grown and gotten more access to more sophisticated meters and sensors, I've realized the same thing occurs at scale. And you can have CO2 sensors that are wildly inaccurate. Um, you know, self-calibrating ones are significantly better and um, there are good and bad out there, but it applies to everything. I've used handheld anemometers and all kinds of different IR guns. And depending on, you know, the build quality and what it is, I get different accuracies. And for me, that's why it's critical to you know, always double check because even if we are collecting data, you know, we might be thinking the temperature is A when the temperature is Q, uh, realistically. So making sure that data's accuracy, I think, is really important for the community as a whole as we scale, too. But, and even if we know the data is inaccurate, knowing where it's inaccurate or why it's inaccurate is of critical importance because then that data is still very useful uh, as a holistic data point. Um, but I don't know, that's just a hot button for me. I'm always like, I used to just, I remember throwing a CO2 sensor against the wall one time when it just kept <laughs> telling me I was at 400. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to break you. You're lying to me. <laughs> you are not helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I know, um, for instance, I have, uh, my fans have, uh, a temperature and humidity monitor on them. And I know that they are a couple of degrees off compared to everything else. I've put like right. four different temperature sensors in there and all of them are within a, a degree, but the monitor on the fan uh, unit is always like three or four degrees different. So you just have to mentally, you mentally adjust in your head. <laughs> like, I know that this one is off by two or three. Uh, the pulse meters too. The pulse meters you have to. Um, you, I always have to adjust them uh, a couple of degrees because their reading is always off what all the other temperature sensors in the tent are telling me. You got it. And I. And then when you go to scale, it's like, where is that reading taken from, and how often was that reading taken? Um, these factors of you know range and resolution and timing of that data allow you to present the data in really falsified ways, which is what I've seen. You know, people say, hey, look at this. And you're like, well, we're looking at a, you know, six hour period. Can we look at it on a, you know, hour by hour period and see what happened? Um, and it just, a, you know, always taking a critical eye to the data, I think is important. Don't be intimidated by it. Grab it, ring it out, try to understand it just like you're doing. You're like, great. Thanks for the data on those fans. I'm going to make my mental adjustment and I'm going to know where we actually are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think also, you, but you have to do both. Uh, you also have to watch the plants 
right? Because uh, as you mentioned earlier on, um, and it's not even necessarily cultivar specific, it might just be pheno specific in certain cases. Uh, Just like some people in your family are good with the temperatures and other people are always cold in your family. Well, it can be the same thing with uh, different phenos of the same plant. Sometimes there's varieties in their reactions, regardless of how well the rest of their brothers and sisters are reacting to that environment. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think another item I wanted to just mention that I thought of while you were talking earlier is um, paying attention to those microclimates, uh, because uh, definitely, especially when you're setting up a facility, uh, when you're first setting up a grow, uh, understanding how the temperature variation can change even on different ends of this of a rack, right? Uh, a friend of mine that I was chatting with a while ago when he was getting set up uh, for some of you may know him, Lost Leaf MI uh, out of Michigan. Uh, he had you know, he had built out this new room and, you know, all the fertigation was working and it looked like all his temperatures were good. And, you know, he had all these different sensors and different things in the room and everything was okay. But there's just one set of plants at this one shelf at this one end of the rack that was not doing well. And it had to do with airflow. Uh, They were getting that much more wind uh, <clears throat> that much more air blown directly on them than everybody else in the rack, which was causing them to grow slower, uh, to be stunted compared to all the other clones that were in that room and in that environment. I see this all the time at scale when people put, you know, 15, 16 pocket dehumidifiers in a space that produce 105 degree heat. Um, you know, they create these microclimates and it's something that uh, I think a lot of people don't truly factor in to what's going on. So, you know, you have these microclimates, you have these pockets of extra heat, and you're taking a look at your data and you're collecting leaf temperatures. And what do you control to in this space? You know, it's going to be a different BPD for the plants that are closer to that pocket dehumidifier putting out heat or the ones that are closer to the inappropriately positioned supply duct. Uh, they're going to see different conditions. Do you want to control to those, to the center of the racks, to the back of the room? And that's why, you know, being able to homogenize those conditions, you know, is a really good way to drive and understand the performance of a cultivar. So you can get homogenized conditions. And instead of thinking, hey, the front of my room is pretty good. The back of my room is not so hot. The middle of my room is great. You're really setting up the environmental itinerary from what is that plant from the moment it's set in that space, from a temperature, humidity, CO2, and inputs perspective, all the way through. And if we can optimize that, then that's why I've started to see these people test at just crazy numbers. You know, a fatso cut from Finus testing at 44% THC with 12% moisture content is great. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Head stash weed, you want to celebrate with your friends for that. Or like a nine-year-old J1 cut, testing it over 4% terps. Now, that's terpy, but you know I usually see that at two and a half. And I think taking on this understanding of we want to apply environmental crop steering stresses, but we only want to do it in a way that helps all of our plants grow. So we need to mitigate those stresses in the first place and apply them in a controlled way that helps us steer and express that those plants, you know. So um, you keyed upon something that I wanted to, to jump into a little bit and, and maybe you can uh, fill me in a little more. And it was something, it was also a, a comment Ben made uh, when I saw him at Nikan while we were, we were chatting and, and some of the things. So uh, you mentioned that uh, dehumidifiers generate heat. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the differences between, uh, dehumidifiers and air conditioners and some of the ways that they impact, uh, humidity levels and temperature levels within your environment? Yeah, I think, you know, 
from a cultivator's perspective and years of trying to get all these units on the same page, you have air conditioners that cool and help you move air and then dehumidifiers that remove moisture and usually pipe it out through a condensate line and get it out of the space. Uh, the problem is, is in order to really effectively get the most use out of those dehumidifiers, we need to make sure that they see the appropriate conditions for the appropriate amount of time. And if they're not appropriately positioned, they won't be able to perform to their, um, you know, ASHRAE stated performance levels. So dehumidifiers are basically trying to grab that air and wring out the moisture by dropping it to a temperature and then reheating it before it goes to the room. In order to do that, you need compressor work in these pocket dehumidifiers, and that creates a lot of heat. And that heat has to go somewhere. And because of the nature of most of these pocket dehumidifiers, you can't remove the heat from the room because it'll reduce their ability to perform. So instead, you need to leave them access points so they can get CFM and they can get air velocity and volume through the unit itself in order to effectively dehumidify. So having them in the space is great because they're helping us with this latent load and pulling moisture out of the space, but they're simultaneously creating heat. And we usually need lots of dehumidification help at peak transpiration when the lights are on. So they're creating heat while we have the lights on and obviously affecting the microclimate. If you need dehumidification in the lights off period, they'll create heat as well, which could be, potentially be beneficial. But also thinking about all the different things that go into a cultivation space. Where we are today is really trying to eliminate microclimates by eliminating as many of those things as possible. You can imagine a wall of oscillating fans. We've all been there. Three of them are clicking. Two of them are going to fail next week. One of them hasn't worked since I got it, but we're getting some airflow. Um, and the fact that we have those units, we have pocket dehumidifiers, we potentially have humidifiers to balance a system that might over dehumidify because it's not purpose built for cannabis, creates these microclimates by the nature of the interaction of all these mechanical devices. If we can remove those from the system, have an integrated approach where we supply air to the space, cruise it through the room, collect that heat and humidity and dump it out the waterfall, we can get a much more homogenized uh, delivery of air and CO2 to those plants and really drive their performance. But microclimates are created by things in the space or dead spaces. And things in the space create dead spaces and they get in the way of airflow. Um, so the more of those we can remove from the space, I understand um, sometimes they're needed. But realistically, the more of those that we can remove, the more we can mitigate through microclimates um, and reduce risk. I think you're also setting yourself up uh, for uh, a larger drop in temperatures and then, of course, a raise in the amount of dew. <laughs> you're going to raise your dew point uh, after those lights go out because you're also going <laughs> to, those humidifiers also might go out and then your temperatures are going to drop. And wow. Yeah, that it sounds like a messy situation. Yeah, and I think what I traditionally see from the data in the space is that conventional non-integrated systems can get a semblance of control of the temperature, but really struggle with humidity, especially as the lights turn off. That flywheel transition period where that plant's been soaking up photonic energy for 12 hours and we shut off the lights, well, she's still continuing to transpire for Depends if we're talking HID or LED, we can get deeper into that for how long. Um, but it could be 45 minutes, it could be an hour and a half where she's still throwing all this moisture off into the space. And that huge spike in humidity is a great opportunity for botrytis and powdery mildew to start to grow. And then as we enter those warmer, high humidity conditions that are appropriate for the VPDs we like in weeks four and five of flower, they sporulate, they spread quickly because we created an opportunity every single time those lights turned off and we got that 20% RH spike, ultimately that could be seven to 10% of your entire flower cycle that you live in that period because it happens every day. And it just creates this situation in the room because the mechanical devices aren't appropriately staged or built or um, controlled, which is another factor we could get into on the level of controls these different units have and what's built for cannabis and what's not. Um, but th so that's sort of the approach, right? It's like, let's remove these microclimates, 
let's remove the things from the room that are creating the microclimates. And we're not even talking about pest and pathogen issues with the oil residue on the fans that's now collecting microbes that we are blowing straight onto our plants or the buildup of mold on the filters, on the pocket dehumidifiers in the space or the drain pan behind the dehumidification coil inside of the unit itself, which is constantly moist and constantly warm. Sounds like a great place for Pythium Fusarium to me. Um, so I'm always looking for those things because for so many years, they've been pain points in, in my growth and my journey. And it's so many times I just want to hit one with a sledgehammer. Um, and I just knew that there was a better way. And you now that's the journey I've been on for the past couple of years. <laughs> the sledgehammer. <laughs> that's real. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> that's what we used. That was plan B. <laughs> one of my old, uh, one, of, one of the guys who used to run uh, infrastructure at, uh, at monster.com uh, that he had a, he had a big ass, uh, like a nine pound sledgehammer. And it was just on the chair in his office with a big sign over it that said plan B. <laughs> That's it. Brute force. Get it done. Everybody needs a plan B. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what else did you want to add on top of that uh, conversation, Ben? Not going to lie. I was just super deep, like elbow deep in the canopy, doing a little bit of defol and uh, <laughs> doing a little bit of cleaning of my under canopy to make sure that I was making a breakup of those microclimates just while we were talking about it. You know, it's, it's hard not to want to immediately enact the things that you have in your mind when you're discussing it. And I just happened to be in the garden, uh, getting things up and running again for this spring for the outdoor season. And uh, so, yeah, I, I was just hardcore focused, just as always listening to Jesse and uh, learning and earning and just working my way through. Well, then share, man, which cultivars are you rocking right now? What you working on? Uh, all right. So I just got a couple of cuts from a friend. Uh, so I've got a GG4 old school, which is really nice. Grows, does really well outdoors. Great grease production. So it protects itself pretty well. The uh, rest of the outdoor crop is going to be a GMO. Some, let's see, Northern Blue, which is a hybrid that my uh, friend, Dr. Green Thumb from the old Icy Mag forums brought up. And he, he said that that's basically like his best, absolute best outdoor cultivar. It's a blend between, uh, let's see, Purple Urkel, Northern Light, and uh, a Blueberry. And then uh, I've got a couple indoor little fan, you know, fan favorites, the, the Hype Cuts. I've got the Runts, Gelato, Dosi. Uh, and then, oh, no, i got one more for the outdoor, Tahoe OG. And oh, uh, then the last one is actually, yeah, I love the Tahoe. It just, it rocks so well, uh, so well outdoors in the New England climate, handles the, the moisture and humidity we get at the end of the season really well too. But I've got a new one actually that he gave to me. That is, it's a, it's a unicorn for sure. If, if she holds true to what she says she should do, uh, she is Blue Widow, which is an in-house cultivar of a friend of mine that is old, old, old school. But uh, she yields footballs and she finishes in... 46 days is what I was quoted. So and completely not, not auto flower. We got not auto flower. She's a uh, complete photo period, but we, we shall see, you know, I like to put things through their paces, whether it's equipment, people or products. And in this case, lineages. So I like to see what things can do, what people say they can do. And I mean, that's, I think that's honestly one of the reasons that Jesse and I first connected and clicked was um, it was the first HVAC company, or in this case, an HVACD company that I called and I didn't feel like I was being sold to. I just had a really good conversation with another grower about HVACD and environmental controls. And it, uh, you know, it really showed me that so much of what we're fed in the industry uh, is not really backed by science. When I dig through lighting companies and all these other companies that I work through as a facility designer doing integrated systems designs, they, everybody puts forth their best foot, uh, but it doesn't always match with what actually the footprint ends up being, so to speak. But li looking at the uh, limited amount of time we have left, uh, if I may, Jason, I would love to make a suggestion for the last half hour of conversation. And uh, it's something that Jesse and I have been talking about a lot and something that is probably the singularly most impactful things that I have learned from Jesse. And that has to do with environmental control during cure and harvest. 
So post harvest, how we dry, how we cure, and how in those last you know one to two weeks of our production cycle, really we can make or break the value of our product that we have spent anywhere from you know four to six months creating. That's a fantastic topic, but just quickly before we jump into that topic, um, and I, I do think that's a great way to uh, to finish off before we start taking general questions. Um, is it true that dehumidifiers reduce CO two levels? There's no reason to think that your dehumidifier is removing CO two. There is a situation where you're running CO2 through ductwork where you could potentially have CO2 loss and you should anticipate a little bit. If you're bringing in outside air, you'll have to exhaust air, so you'll have a loss. But the dehumidifier itself is not a consumer of CO2 or a destructor of CO2. So there's no reason to believe that the dehumidifier itself is uh, reducing CO2. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So fantastic, fantastic. Let's get into that topic then. Let's talk about curing. Yeah, I think to start, I want to just take one quick step back, right? Then, you know, phenotypic expression is 50% genetics and 50% environment. That's the definition of a phenotype. So whether or not you're able to achieve that quick harvest time with that product is going to be a lot, you know, influenced by the 10 cardinal parameters and your ability to manipulate all those tools in the right way to get that phenotypic expression. And what's so important is that if we work that hard to get this phenotypic expression out of these unique cultivars that you're running and some of the uh, popular ones as well, um, we're going to need to, you know, protect the customer experience or in a lot of our cases, our own personal experience. So for me, historically, we've cured in an anecdotal way, in a way that allows us to smoke our weed and be happy with it. And it's really been the basis for every scientific study on curing that I've seen in the cannabis space. Uh, so it's an interesting conversation and there's so many rabbit holes to go down. Um, I'd love to, you know, maybe think what you want to start with, Ben. But for me, curing is the way that I've lost the most money over the years, the way that I've gained the most money, um, and the way that I've won the most cannabis cups. And truly, you know, in an effort to grow the best weed in the world, always thinking about my mom. Um, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, I've really explored the scientific slash, you know, anecdotal knowledge um, that allows us to set some guide rails for success and at least really understand what's going on from a high level on what we need to control and worry about in the curing process. Uh, the mastery of how we stimulate each individual enzyme at what time, with what temperature and what water activity. Man, we're going to be arguing about white papers if we go that route. Um, but I think from a high level, there's a lot of good pieces of information um, that'll be useful to, to people in the caring space. I think the hardest thing about caring is that there is no that way to do it. But what we do know is that we can't fail test we don't want to rot our product. We don't want to grow mold and mildew in the space. And we want to preserve secondary metabolites. We want it to be as terpy and cannabinoid heavy as possible. So how do we preserve those secondary metabolites and avoid the loss associated with, you know, whether it's botrytis or aspergillus or whatever we test for, um, whatever we fail to test for. It's about understanding what we need to do in the process of curing. And this is highly debated. It's highly debated within my company where we have you know, other experts as well um, is, you know, how much moisture do we really need to remove in order to be safe? And for me, this whole curing and drying process is it starts the moment you harvest. And you're basically deciding how you want to control the moisture migration from your product. And for me, there's a couple of big factors. 
early on, we need to remove as much, as much moisture as possible in order to get to a water activity where this product is safe and not growing molds or mildews. We know some of those thresholds, so we have a goal. How quickly do we need to get there? We're not totally sure, but two, three, four days, it's probably your max. So when we think about curing, oftentimes we think about this slow and low technique, but time is one of the biggest enemies. It causes oxidation, degradation. It also helps with polymerization, but we can achieve that through enzymatic activity. So what I usually say to people is really try to understand the product temperature. The same way Ben and I get excited about taking leaf temperature measurements for accuracy, take product temperature measurements uh, of the actual bud. And you might have a set point of 65 in that room, but the bud temp is actually 55. And a 55 degree uh, bud is not gonna migrate enough moisture out quickly enough in the first couple of days to prevent some sort of spoilage. So you'll be battling it at the end all the time. So understanding that you can raise your ambient conditions, especially in the first few days, because this is a you know, uh, HVAC engineering dry bulb, wet bulb conversation. We have a product that's wet and we're spinning it around in the air and it's much cooler than the dry product we're spinning around in the air. Well, early on in the curing process, that product is wet and that makes it much cooler than the ambient. So we can drive our ambient conditions a little bit warmer, control the temperature of the product, migrate as much moisture as you can in the first couple of days. I know we don't all have water activity and moisture content meters, um, but we're trying to get really below uh, a 0.65 for sale. And in my opinion, you know, you wanna measure that water activity as you go, but remove a lot of moisture uh, at a warmer temp. And then as soon as that product temperature starts to climb closer to ambient, you drop the temperature, you maintain the same humidity, and now you have stimulated enzymatic activity and you bought yourself a safety zone to ride in to allow that polymerization of secondary metabolites to occur. So you've, with heat and water, stimulated the activity and removed the moisture. Then you've dropped to a safe zone where your product's not gonna grow mold and mildew, and you can remain in that zone for two, three, four, 10, 15 days, depending on how you like to talk about the curing cycle or think about enzymatic activity and what you're trying to achieve in the final product. Um, but the idea is then you're dropping to a point where you remove it from that space, you give it a final trim, and you seal it up. You don't need to burp it. You don't need to come back and navigate it. Now, as a home grower, I probably would come back and burp it because we don't know we're at a 0.65 water activity. But in the commercial setting, that's where you get that full terpene capture. Some of it's in the jar or the bag, but your likelihood of capturing some of the monos is much higher. If you have less touches and the process isn't about, you know, burping and moving things around. It's about controlling the moisture and water activity to stimulate the enzymatic activity to get the best phenotypic expression capture, and then packaging that up for the consumer or for yourself to smoke later and not exposing it to oxygen or light or high temperatures. That's my elevator pitch that went way too long on caring, but um, I do love- No, I think that that's- topic. I think that that's a really, really solid point, Jesse. I mean, you completely changed the way that I looked at dry and cure from it being, uh, you know, like a finishing icing on the cake type of a move where, you know, the vast majority of the work has been finished. And now you're just really just sort of letting it ride and finish out. And you changed it to a perspective where I started to realize that this is really the major work because throughout the entire process, you know, whether we're talking home cultivation or we're talking large scale facilities, you're dealing with a situation of months and that gives you a lot more play where when you're dealing with months, you have a much larger safety zone where you can step outside of acceptable parameters. And, you know, there may be some detrimental effects to that, but the extent of that detrimental effect is a lot more limited provided you're able to step back into parameters pretty quickly. But when you're talking about a dry and cure, you're you know, you're talking about a couple of weeks at maximum. And even with, you know, the high quality efficiency systems that you're able to get these days, you can get that down to a week, you know, a, a little over a week, maybe with some of the really dense cultivars. But the allowance of polymerization of these terpenes really, really, and cannabinoids as well, really developed my understanding 
of the entire chemistry that's happening here, rather than just what we initially think of, which is, you know, preservation of terpenes and cannabinoids as best as we can. But really, our goal is dehumidification and dropping those temperatures, because a lot of us understand that, you know, the monoterpenes specifically, some of them start to volatilize at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So we always are thinking, you know, drop the temps as fast as you can and just try to really preserve that flower, preserve those terpenes, preserve the cannabinoids that we worked so hard to get. And when you first told me that we should actually do the opposite, the inverse for the first, you know, 48 hours or so, depending upon that leaf temperature, which is really what you're reading, it blew my mind. But then it just, just it, it started to make so much more sense on an organic chemistry level. And it, I mean, it really is incredible what you're able to do. And, and what I finally come to terms with is the fact that dry and cure really isn't about drying as much as it's about preservation and not trying to, you know, you know, we're not juicing more terps and more cannabinoids through our process. We're not able to develop those secondary metabolites once the plant is done cultivation. Once it's been harvested and separated from its root source and removed from the environment in which it was growing, then that that process is finished. But what we can do is we can allow for evolution of those chemical compounds and we can allow for a heightened preservation of those chemical compounds so that, you know, you could be pulling much higher levels than you actually are testing out at and you're just not preserving them well enough. And by understanding this secondary process of dry and cure down to that level that you're able to bring it to, it allows people like us to be able to actually understand and much more control our dry and cure cycle to, you know, really save and preserve all of that love, hard work and effort that we've put into getting this plant from a seedling or a cut all the way through vegetation, through flowering and to this final point. It's a very, very interesting concept. Um, you know, it uh, in some ways makes me feel a little bit less bad that I can't normally get my tempers temps down to those 50 degrees as my home grow you know i got a drying tent in my basement that thing's running in the high 60s low 70s at best and and so um you know i'm not able to necessarily manage these extreme um you know ideal uh, conditions for my drying phase uh, once I get into the curing phase and I get a lot of the moisture out of it and I can put it into a container, then I can put it in the curador and drop those temps down and, and keep it in that 50, you know, those low to mid 50s uh, for the curing process before I trim. And, and so that, you know, that part I can control, but that initial drying and hanging, yeah, I'm going to be in some of those warmer temperatures. So now I actually feel a little bit best, less bad about that. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, like, you can quell your fears with data and a tool, right? An, an emissivity adjustable IR gun adjusted to 0 0.97, in my opinion, is the most accurate tool for determining leaf temperature of a cannabis plant. And, you know, they're not expensive. We're talking a $35 one. You could get a $100 fluke one. They're a little bit better. But then you can say, okay, I know my ambient conditions are high. But hey, my bud temp's actually pretty good. Like I'm not too worried about that. That's a that's a good chill temp, even though I'm reading 72 on my ambient, you know, or 75 even. Um, so I think that's you know that's sort of fun to go in there and play with that and just better understand the the process and the tools and the temperatures of things and what's going on um, allows you to better understand the process. So so you know. What are some, and I know Ben is is like uh, he's got a he's got a incredible tool belt of uh, items that he carries with him uh, all the time, and he's actually expanding into uh, like a Chewbacca bandolier pretty soon because he's got so much gear that even his holster isn't going to be able to hold everything that he's got. So, but what are some of the tools? Uh, that you've mentioned today or that you think people should be uh, getting to help uh, with uh, understanding better what's going on? Yeah, I think this is a hard one because I immediately go to expensive things. And um, <laughs> uh, But the reality is, you know, at commercial level, um, when you're growing, you know, 10 to $15 million of cannabis a year, a five to ten thousand dollar expenditure for a water activity meter that has a programmed in cannabis isotherm, something that you could get from meter group like an Aqualab for, or otherwise, there's others that work as well. 
um, that's a really accurate tool for during the curing process, you can go pluck a sample and understand what the moisture content is from a percentage perspective and what a water activity is. And you can understand the, you know, molecular, you know, the ability of that water to do work and understand where it is in different phases. So understanding what your de dehumidification and, you know, cooling capacities are, to me, the, the really big tools for mastering this at a scientific uh, level to allow artists to really be able to paint the best possible picture, whether it's for extract or um, for a, a, a branded product on the shelf, is a really accurate water activity meter and moisture content meter and a cannabis isotherm. And if you Google isotherms out there, you'll sort of see what I'm talking about. Most of them are pretty generic for other things like coffee and beef jerky. But the enzymatic activity, the mold, bacteria, and yeast, the browning reaction, the degradation of fatty acids, the chlorophyll breakdown, it's all there. And you can navigate it with moisture content and water activity, knowing the temperature of your space. So to me, that's the triangulation. Now you need to have a system that can give you precision enough control. So again, we're back to air exchanges and removing microclimates and understanding that. Um, and then being able to collect the data on how much moisture is removed, you really have a pretty good idea where you're at. But to me, that's the big tool. Um, sorry, Ben, I know you want to chime in there. Yeah, no, I was just going to say uh, from the, you know, <clears throat> the point where we all started from, where I feel a lot of the listeners to this are, uh, is that home grow set. And I mean, really the things that I would say are the most imperative for you to understand your environmental parameters is understanding leaf temperature, understanding ambient temperature, ambient relative humidity, and then your PPFD on canopy. And if you're supplementing CO2, then a CO2 meter as well. So a, a quality PAR meter uh, will allow you to understand what the you know, the spread of photosynthetic radiation is. A PPFD meter will allow you to understand your intensity at canopy. Then something like an infrared laser thermometer, like uh, Jesse had said, I mean, I use um, a moderately expensive Kaizen. It's, you know, not the most top of the line, but it's certainly not bottom of the barrel. And so you pay for what you get with your equipment, but understanding leaf temperature through an IR thermometer, understanding your ambient temperature and ambient relative humidity with a good hydrometer thermometer, and then having, you know, some form of quality light meter that allows you to understand your PPFD at canopy. And I mean, really, you shouldn't have to be measuring your PAR because the lights that you're getting should be giving you a PAR spectrum. Whether you're running an HID, that bulb will come with a spectrum uh, printout. Or if you're running an LED, it'll come with a printout. And unless you're talking about running LEDs extremely long, you're not going to be seeing that much of a degradation in that. And with HIDs, I mean, we all know that you need to be changing out your bulbs at least every, you know, so many runs usually depends on what kind of a bulb and how hard you're running it. But, um, that's sort of like another parameter that you can check on is the quality of your equipment's actual outputs. But the only other piece of equipment that I would recommend is, I mean, in a home grow, it's not as important, but an anometer, which is basically a wind speed measure. And it allows you to determine, you know, at canopy, above canopy, through canopy, what you're actually putting for wind velocity on your plant. So when we're talking about trying to quantify these different metrics, you need to be able to get all of them together. Because if you just have one metric, if you just have leaf temperature, or you just have your PPFD, or you just have your ambient um, temperature and hydrometry, then you, you only have a piece of the puzzle. Like we were talking about at the beginning, it's a compounding equation. So to really get a finite and exact answer for that end of the equation as to what your plants are doing, you need to be able to input at least a reasonably accurate level of information for, for all of those you know major inputs. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if I could launch into, you know, get an integrated system, that's the best solution. But I think realistically, a good tool is to understand how to calculate your loads. It's something that's foreign to so many cultivators, and it shouldn't be that intimidating. We talk about light intensity and measuring lighting and flow rates with fertigation and EC bounces and drybacks and all these other things that are also just as equally as complicated. And I think understanding how to figure out how much moisture you think you need to remove from the space and then understanding what the mechanical performance you're investing in is really important and being able to calculate that appropriately. If you don't, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go through equations with everybody, but reach out. 
I love doing load calcs. I love sharing the formulas and the knowledge that aren't antiquated or built for field crops. They're built for cannabis and they allow you to choose some variables that are of critical importance for understanding what you need. Now, in lieu of the performance that you need, airflow is your best friend. And I've said this for tent grows, garage grows, and every grow I've ever been a part of, including large scale um, cloning operations um, that were based upon airflow. Um, understanding that you have convective cooling at your fingertips as these plants transpire, they're little humidifiers. And if we just blow air with the appropriate deltas across them, they'll be able to cool themselves. And when we're in the curing space, you're never going to blow secondary metabolites off the plant. But blowing that air allows you for more convective cooling, better airflow, removal of gases, methylene, CO2, whatever degradation gases might be occurring in the process. Airflow is your best friend. So when you want to lean on someone, lean on airflow uh, in the small scale. It's always served me well. There's a lots, of, lots of different ways to lean on it, um, but using that usually can offset some of the other parameters, volatilities. Yeah, and as I, I said, in the, again. no, no, perfect, right on point. I was going to say that, you know, what I say in all of my conferences, all my lectures and classes is that there is no such thing as too much data. The more data points that you have, provided it's, you know, reasonably accurate data, or if it's not accurate, know its range of inaccuracy. So like we were talking about earlier, you don't have to have the singularly most efficient piece of equipment in the market, but if you're able to somewhat calibrate its level of inaccuracy through other pieces of equipment that your friends may have, you know, get four of your people together that all have laser thermometers, find out what the, you know, range of accuracy is, what your average of accuracy between the most closely grouped ones are. And then you can start to determine where it's like, all right, so I know my thermometer always reads about three degrees low. Or I know that, you know, this light meter is not that accurate. So it always reads about 50 PPFD lower than it should be. If you know your range of inaccuracy, you can make some pretty educated guesses to, to try to dial in your environment without having to invest the level of infrastructural money that's required for a lot of these really, you know, high powered, high quality professional pieces of equipment. Not everybody can afford to as, as Hoda pointed out, uh, drop a couple thousand dollars on a tool belt full of goodies that allow you to gather the most accurate data or to be able to drop five to 10 K on a moisture meter that really allows you to dial in what your active moisture levels are in your product as it's finishing. So yeah. operating in your means and operating within your goals is, is something that should also be taken into consideration. All right. Uh, so, Brian, you uh, you did raise your hand early on in the conversation. Did you have any comments or questions uh, tonight? I did mute you when you came up, so you'll need to unmute yourself to join in the conversation. Brian, are you there? Okay. Uh, so, um, any final words to wrap up with, uh, tonight, Jesse, any final thoughts on things that you'd like people to know? No, oh, just, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have an open conversation. Uh, I'm a guy that's pretty candid and transparent as Ben will tell you. I love sharing knowledge. I love collecting knowledge and, you know, I'm always growing. I think, um, a lot of times you never know where you're going to learn the next tidbit that helps you put the piece of the puzzle together. So be open to it and, you know, know what you know, and, you know, be open with, with yourself about what you don't. And I think that really allows you to, you know, go on your journey at the appropriate pace. Um, and I know for me, I've been able to learn from so many people. Ben is a great example. There are a lot of people in this space that are really driving the understanding of the solutions that they provide. And I think it's great to have that data. And uh, yeah, I mean, Inspire Transpiration Solutions is where I call home. And uh, I love to talk about, you know, all kinds of things. Cannabis is, I think you guys know at this point, um, but really dialing in the environment is uh, something that has been a true challenge of mine for a lifetime. And uh, it's just been really fun to discover and share 
uh, what I've been able to learn at scale, which is where I'm at now, you know, larger scale facilities. But just like everyone here, you know, I've been a small grower, I've been a closet grower, I've been a tank grower, a garage grower, warehouse grower, multiple homes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I own a tank or a farm. Uh, it's been a great journey. And uh, again, you know, Jason, thanks for letting me come on, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It was definitely a pleasure having you. Brian, I see you got your uh, microphone unmuted. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Sorry about the early hand raising. Uh, oh, no worries at all. And uh, also unable to unmute fat thumbs again. Anyway, <laughs> I did fine. have a couple of questions. One was about uh, regarding BPD, uh, laminar airflow above the canopy versus uh, direct fans. I've seen a lot of people just blowing the fans right at the, at the plant. And I just have a laminar airflow above the canopy. Uh, is that better for VPD? That's a great question. It has a little bit to do with the supply return configurations in that space and how the air is cycled. Um, but the top-down delivery mechanism uh, of airflow does a really good job of homogenizing leaf conditions, which allow you to get a much more accurate ability to use VPD as a tool over the whole garden. So I, I, I should tell you for context, I'm in a 10 by 12 greenhouse and I, I do have uh, cool air from down below and uh, from an evaporative cooler and uh, auxiliary air conditioner. And I have an exhaust fan high up in the very top to slowly pull the humidity out. And that's my setup. I like it. I like it. I think that um, when it comes to airflow, it's pretty easy to stress the plants at close proximities with high applications of airflow. And the level of penetration sideways or even top down through the canopy is pretty low. It's always easier to penetrate the canopy bottom up or top down. Bottom up's the easiest, top down's the next easiest, but from the sides with that airflow is not nearly as effective. And it will cause um, still model closure as I've seen relative to the ability of plants to achieve their drybacks at scale when they're close to those fans, oscillating fans, have fans, whatever it might be, that wind whipping by creates the model closure that trans that plant transpires at a lower rate. And it might just be half of a tray, you know, two feet of a tray on the left-hand side where that airflow goes. So I think, you know, the laminar approach is hard to achieve, but it's, it is much more effective at homogenizing the conditions and moving that air in a way that the plant can use its plasticity to adjust versus holding its breath and freaking out and waiting for that condition to stop. She can say, oh, you know, it's a little warm. Maybe I don't have as much CO2 as I want. Maybe there are some things a little out of whack, but because the conditions are homogenous and consistent, I can do this and she'll produce less domata. She'll adapt to the space. Um, so what you're doing it allows uh, for some plant flexibility um, and uh, I think a bigger tarmac for success. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yes, it does. Uh, the other part of it was about the fans uh, at night. Is it better to turn your circulation fans off? Uh, I, I do think I leave my exhaust fan on very low at night. It, like I said, it's a greenhouse in my backyard. Yeah, I would say that I never want to have stagnant conditions. Um, I don't want quote unquote eddies in this river of air, right? Where it just this pocket of stuff's not moving, it gets grimy, becomes anaerobic, it builds up microbes that fight our good microbes and get in the way. Um, so your subtle exhaust system might very well be enough to continue to pull air through and by the plants at a fair enough velocity. Um, I have seen people approach mild uh, fan implementations for a number of different crop steering approaches when the lights are off. Um, I think what's really important is that we just don't have stagnant spaces. So we don't need airflow necessarily for higher levels of respiration, although it could be beneficial. 
if I had a sub canopy airflow device, I would very likely run it at the nighttime periods uh, to continue to facilitate gas exchange, in this case, uh, respiration and prevent what uh, Ben was talking about is this CO2 off gassing that can create sort of a heavy halo and come down and suffocate the top layer of roots with too much CO2 and prevent some of the respiration process. Um, getting a little sidetracked here, but uh, I think that really what I'm getting at is at the nighttime period, we're not driving photosynthetic rate, we're recovering. And recovering, you don't want a heavy breeze at your back, you want a very light, mellow scenario. And the closer you can get the VPD that you have during the daylight period to the VPD you have at the nighttime period, the much more likely you are to avoid powdery mildew and botrytis in the late stages. So I think that's the thing to think about is if we do more fan speed, do we get more convective cooling? Does that make our plants that much colder at night where the delta in temperature between daylight and nights off is uh, problematic? And I think having a very light airflow probably keeps them a little bit warmer um, and allows them to be a little bit closer to that daytime VPD. That uh, yeah, all right, sounds great. great. Answers my question. Awesome, Brian. Yeah, I think that that's something that a lot of people really need to consider is how pathogenic incursion is so dependent. Pest minorly, but pathogenic specifically is so dependent upon your environmental control. Mitigating these extreme spikes in humidity and temperature is really the way that we are able to implement IPM, integrated pest management practices, through environmental control. And I mean, specifically operating in the state of Massachusetts, when we work at scale and we're working in the legal industry, we have no access to EPA registered uh, pesticides or fungicides. So we are exclusively limited to a very, very finite number of naturally derived 25B items. And though they can be effective to some extent in proper application with proper timing, they really have, have you know, a long way to go to be as effective as the other OMRI and, FD, and uh, EPA certified products on the market. So our greatest tool, our greatest weapon against pathogenic incursions during flowering is our environmental controls, is monitoring and mastering this VPD balance between lights on and lights off and mitigating that range of differential swing. So when we have a opportunity to get that type of control, it's, it's really the most crucial thing there is. In my opinion, environmental control is the singularly most important facility system that, that there is. I mean, if you give me mediocre lights and mediocre nutrients and the best environmental controls, I'll grow you some moderately good to decently good product. If you give me the exact opposite, and I've got the worst environmentals with the best lights and the best nutrients, I'm going to grow you some incredible mold. And really what it comes down to is that it doesn't matter quite how healthy and dialed in that plant is if the environment itself is not conducive to its growth. And that's one of the, the brilliant things about managing this vapor pressure deficit between lights on and lights off. And that's like Jesse hit it on the head, powdery mildew. Powdery mildew requires dry environment to sporulate and broadcast throughout your environment. So that's your daytime, that's your lights on. Your relative humidity is lower, your temperature is about you know the same as far as your overall scope, and you've got greater air circulation. So you're spreading these spores around as they're sporulating off of those little patches that you haven't found yet, or the ones that you have found and you're fighting. <clears throat> then when the lights turn off and you can get a vapor pressure deficit that shifts drastically because you have a huge humidity spike, or even if you mitigate that humidity to some extent, but not exclusively, powdery mildew requires a moist surface to germinate. So if you have dry air during the day and it's spreading around, and then you have even the littlest bit of moisture on those leaf surfaces in the evening, and once those lights turn off, you immediately will have a drastic issue that can go from a small area to the entire crop very rapidly. And it can seem like you have no control over it because it's just happening no matter what you do with your foliar treatments and your defoliations and your proactive approach. But really what it comes down to is just an inadequate environmental control. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Fantastic question. Uh, 
Brian, I appreciate that. Uh, led to a really, really good conversation. Uh, do we have anybody else? Uh, Prince, let's see, we'll bring you up, sir. What is your question today, Prince? Yeah, thanks. I just, I just came into the group, I'm just listening and hearing your conversation. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, fam. Oh, Jason, I think you're muted. How's everything in the future there, sir? Appreciate you coming up and saying hello. Very good. Thank you, Jason. Um, wise words. Thanks, team. Thanks for hosting. Um, I've got a question on uh, mold spores in the drying facility. If you can see a picture of my... Uh, employers uh, drain facility so we've been subcontracted on an outdoor operation cultivating medicinal cannabis uh, sadly with the outdoor weather at the moment we've had a bit of mold botrytis a little bit of powdery mildew but not too much um, but definitely the botrytis has hit us where the caterpillars have uh, eaten their way through anyway long short story as you can see from my picture, we have a drying process in a air-conditioned uh, shipping container. It has a Quest extraction unit set at 6060. So it's attempting to, well, it's, it's set at 40, 40 relative humidity. Um, but the actual humidity gets anywhere up to 85, obviously. We're still harvesting plants and bringing in plants. My question is, is I've, I've never taken what looked like moldy plant material into my drying facility. I've, much like yourselves, started in a small closet, worked my way up from you know, one to two to five to 20 to 200 to 400 plants. I've never grown 2,000 plants, and I've never had such a serious infestation of botrytis. Now, I didn't want to bring any of the what looked like moldy weed into the drying room. I was just wondering what the... Um, um how much is that mold spores what what is the effect of those mold spores going to do to the rest of the plants as it's been circulated around the room are those mold spores just hibernating at the 16 degree fahrenheit i mean 15 degree celsius um are they just sleeping and are they going to be reactivated when they get moisture again that's my my only concern is that we've bagged it into these black bags and the stems although they've snapped they are still quite green obviously they've only been quick dried for seven days and then we've put them in buckets and bags and i'm just concerned that the mold will reactivate if we don't get on top of that straight away what's your um mm. questions on that answers that's a great question um so first off uh, bacillus serogenesis, get rid of those caterpillars, take a look at migratory patterns, apply, you know, dark periods, shade periods when the sun is not out to try and get that prevented in the first place. Because those nocturnal moths that lay those tiny little eggs that seem to hatch overnight and just destroy and burrow into the bud, they, they create these, you know, pockets of botrytis and mold as they poop inside your weed. And it's really hard to take that product into a space and think that you're going to arrest the development of botrytis. Now, um, botrytis it has a water activity around 0.8. So we need to get below 0.8 as quickly as possible. And that doesn't mean that we might not have other sporulates that we're not uh, appropriately identifying that, that might exist in the space because we just see the one big threat and we can ID that appropriately. Um, so we, what we need to do is race to a moisture removal period to get as much moisture out of that product as quickly as possible below a 0.8 water activity. And at least we know we're out of the range of botrytis. Um, it's not going to grow anymore. It doesn't have enough moisture within that product. 
now as for the Botrytis that now exists within everything in that space, including the Quest dehumidifier and uh, every other aspect. It just needs to be cleaned. And there are a number of different ways that it can be cleaned, but it does need to be cleaned because it will sit and rest and wait for an opportunity to sporulate again. So a uh, quick application of a number of different products will solve that problem and make sure that you clean the coil inside the uh, quest with some soapy water, spray it down, a little high pressure sprayer in there, get the drain pan too, blast out that filter. Um, and you should be, you know, wiping down the interior of the room. You should be good to go. But until you prevent the, you know, uh, moth and caterpillar issue with preventative maintenance, it'll be an ongoing battle of bring it in, raise the temperature, try and drive as much moisture out of this product as quickly as you can. Um, there are different ways to position that quest that might be more beneficial. But again, thinking about airflow and just driving as much airflow and potentially taking the heat and dehumidified air from the Quest and blowing it by. Again, I'd mentioned about uh, understanding performance. So that Quest unit as it's set at 105 pints per day or whatever it is, is set to perform at that standard at 80 degrees and 62% RH. The moment you choose to change those set points lower, the capacity reduces dramatically dramatically. So understanding what the capacity you have out of that unit and how much weight you can actually put in there and how much air you need to bring in to mitigate the risk to remove enough moisture in the first two days to get below 0.8, I think is a strategy to avoid it and then clean the room. Just um, a quick, easy clean. Um, again, there's lots of different products. Um, you'll be able to solve that problem, but I would advise taking the room down, not having product in there, cleaning it thoroughly and cleaning the unit in the space as well. That adequately address the question? Yes, sir. Um, and the water activity, I did post in the question area. Um, I know actually Benjamin's answered this uh, question. So thank you, Benjamin. Uh, and thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, London. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody else. Job bless and one love from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Awesome. My pleasure. But uh, Doctor, one one last thing, just because Jesse had sort of, you know, he he dropped a lot of knowledge right there. Um, so as far as like what type of products that you can utilize to try to clean that space and to try to clean those products, you're looking for general antimicrobials. Um, something that can be very non-invasive, non-destructive, but extremely effective would be things like parasitic acid and phosphoric acid. Uh, both of those are able to degrade through oxidation and through UV photo exposure to rather inert substances. So you're not leaving uh, a residual behind in that space that could be detrimental in the long run or could provide off gassing. We need to be careful when utilizing cleaning products of what those active ingredients are and what secondary ramifications they can have when being brought into spaces that are so tightly controlled like a drying and curing room. Awesome, Thanks, awesome add-on. Fantastic stuff. Okay, uh, we are over the two-hour mark, and I do greatly appreciate everybody sticking with us for the full two hours tonight. Ben, uh, Jesse had a chance to wrap up. Ben, any final thoughts that you wanted to wrap up with tonight? Honestly, just uh, truly a deep sense of appreciation uh, getting to bring together two of the people that I have great affection for, you and Jesse, and getting to have such a constructive conversation. I truly enjoy these conversations so much, and I thrive on this, this level of academic approach to cultivation and really enjoy to see how the market is shifting and how the industry as a whole is shifting um, towards this truly science-based and repeatable analytical data-based approach to cultivation and to our industry as a whole. And it's just, you know, it's a beautiful experience and I'm very thankful. Um, if I had to leave a parting thought, it would be, there is no two, there's no such thing as too much data collection. Your sustainability begins with your initial designs of your equipment selections. And that when you're thinking about a small scale grow or a large scale grow, really understanding what the parameters that you're operating within are and understanding what your external influencing factors are and being able to find a way to balance the two of those, to find that 
somewhat at least happy medium where your plants can thrive and you can reap in, you know, the harvest that you want to sow. You know, you, you put in all this effort, you put in all this time and money, whether you're a small scale grower or a large scale grower. At the end of the day, we all just want to be able to have something that we are proud of, that we can appreciate and that we can enjoy and, you know, preferentially be able to share with our friends. Awesome. Awesome point. All right. So this has been episode 28 of Hot Herbs Grow and Tell. As a reminder, we are here every week on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific for our weekly cultivation club. Uh, you can definitely find me uh, on Clubhouse here every week. You can also find me on YouTube as well as at Hota Herb on Instagram uh, is a great place to check in. Uh, if you like the conversation, make sure you join the Future Cannabis Club. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Uh, if you want to go back and listen to this episode as well as some of the past episodes, I do have a great playlist saved uh, on my Instagram page and my profile. So you can just click on that and it will just bring you up the playlist of all the past episodes. As I mentioned, this is episode 28. Uh, and so there's all sorts of fantastic content out there for you to go back and check. Uh, so we do appreciate everybody joining us uh, this week, as well as every other week on both Clubhouse and YouTube. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week and a wonderful weekend. London, sir, are you ready to bring us out? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you again, everybody, for joining. And we will catch you next week uh, here on Hook to Herbs Grow and Tell. Have a fantastic night. Later all. Right. There we are here. Where is this thing in here? Go ahead. Ha ha. Have too much hair. Not enough time. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed that fantastic show as always every single week. We have a lot of stuff growing on. As you can see, the plants are slowly overwhelming me. You can see in the front here, we have some Kandahar uh, red ice cream cake crosses from fucking Mr. Trees right there. We've got some Syrah, some of my own crosses here. I've got some. It's just they're growing and they're taking over the entire space. But it's okay because you, you get to grow along with me, which makes it, oh, shit. The whole fucking time, eh? Uh, can you not hear me at all? Am I muted? Am I muted? I hear him. Good. Thank you, Brian. You're killing me, Brian, daddy. Um, but yes, so we got a lot of stuff growing on, a lot of things coming up in the future. If we have a little peek at what is going on over the next couple of days, because you do not want to miss, miss out on touring a farm with Elka tomorrow morning. Um, he's going to be going through his garden or a garden. We're not too sure, but I'm excited for that to happen. Um, we have the Perfectly Imperfect Grow Show on Saturday, as always. Well, not as always, but with Chad Westport, everybody's favorite long-haired uh, guru. We have uh, and a few things going on next week. We got breeders for. Uh, we've got a gathering glass meets. Dane Cower collaboration coming on Tuesday next week, which is going to be a lot of fun. We've got uh, Mojave Richmond and Sour Silicate uh, joining us for that show. So that'd be a lot of fun. I don't have it posted up there yet, but you will see it coming down the pipeline because you all do. Now, don't forget to check out Dagadot Academy, post something, maybe get some free seats because we'll be doing something coming up soon, probably. Um, get on there, post, join, be part of the community. And don't forget to check everything else out that you can. I, I'm a little worried that my my mother... No, no, okay. We are done for the evening. I appreciate each and every one of you. Check out that. And check out my Cunning Folk line on Daga uh, Garden. Because it's good shit. And there's lots of those plants around here too. I'll keep you updated. Happy growing.